Huh? Huh? Hmm? Huh. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the channel, Sticky History. Today's subject is a little bit different, as we'll be talking a bit about the Russian peasant, Grigory Rasputin. Rasputin lived in Russia from 1869 until his assassination on the 30th of December 1916. He's well known due to his charming demeanour, as well as his claims of being a Russian holy man, which led him to becoming an influential character at the Russian court as well as with the Romanov family. Whilst being his greatest achievement, this would also be his downfall. But let's revisit 1869, Siberia, where Rasputin was born. Rasputin's journey as a holy man began from a young age, when he was able to heal horses that were sick, and also know things about other people that were seemingly impossible for him to know. Pretty creepy. People began calling him the second coming of Christ, and this is where it became apparent that he was no ordinary young boy. During his youth and early years, Rasputin was a bit of a rascal. He began to drink and steal things which ultimately got him into some trouble. At this point, due to a lack of formal education, Rasputin was illiterate and remained this way for many of his adult years. Despite this information, notoriously little is known about Rasputin's childhood and early years. But by the age of 28, there is a little more documentation. It was now that Rasputin turned towards God. Allegedly, after stealing a horse and spiralling into drink and infidelity, he had no choice other than to abandon ship and run to a monastery. It is worth noting, however, that there is no definitive answer for why he chose to leave, only that he did, and the rest is gossip and Chinese whispers. At the monastery, a man called Makary took Rasputin under his wing and taught him to read and write. And understandably, Rasputin left this experience a changed man. Changes included a turning his back on drinking, praying and giving up meat. He also began to wander away from his home in Poproskoy and around Russia to nearby countries. On these journeys, he would also take part in self-flagellatory activities. Rasputin's reputation as a holy man led to him gaining a small following of locals and relatives when he was at home in Siberia. Here, they would take part in prayers and ceremonies, much to the suspicion of the other townsfolk. Despite this, the name Rasputin was becoming relatively well known in surrounding areas. He was known for his healing powers, a trait that would help him to seduce even the highest members of society. People would travel from far and wide just to be healed by THE Rasputin. His reputation led to the recognition of some higher people in the Russian church. He was invited to travel to St. Petersburg to meet Bishop Sergei and, most importantly for Rasputin, Archmanagerite Theophan, or Theophan of Poltava. And now I say importantly because Theophan was an incredibly well-connected person in the Russian capital and he later became the confessor to the Tsar. These connections allowed Rasputin to get his foot in the door in Russian society, and his mystical healing powers helped him to keep it there. It's contested among historians for how long Rasputin stayed in St. Petersburg before returning to Port Roskoy, but it was somewhere between 1903 and 1905. During his stay, he had managed to establish relationships with people connected to royalty, who later introduced him to the royal family itself. It's easy to see why Rasputin was so quickly welcomed into the Russian aristocracy in the early 20th century. Beliefs and feelings towards spiritual practices were optimistic, which gave Rasputin some credibility. People were fascinated by his so-called powers, especially the Russian elite. This included the Tsar. He, like many others, was enchanted by Rasputin and named him a man of God. It was thanks to Rasputin's healing powers that the Tsar invited him to take a look at his sickly son, Alexei, who was suffering from haemophilia. Although he was able to stem the blood flow and ease Alexei's pain from time to time, there's no evidence that he was able to cure the heir to the Russian Tsardom. However, Alexandra the Tsarina was wowed by Rasputin as she believed that the work was in fact easing her son's suffering. It was not until 1912, however, that people had true cause to believe in Rasputin's powers. 
When Alexei developed a hematoma in his upper thigh, he fell very ill and was on the edge of death. The Tsarina wrote to Rasputin to ask for his prayers, believing that he could help to heal her son, even from 3,000 miles away. However, following the prompt reply from Rasputin, the boy began to get better despite receiving little medical attention. This miracle led people to believe that Rasputin had healing powers and was the second coming of Christ. This stunt gave Rasputin much power and preference in the Russian court, which made many people suspicious of him. As you may have heard in the past, he was rumoured to have had an affair with a Tsarina, which isn't too beyond belief considering his reputation with women over the years, if you know what I mean. However, historians do not believe this to be true. It is no secret that he was widely disliked in Russia and by the Russian church. He was condemned as a heretic in his hometown and was not particularly popular with the Prime Minister at the time, Peter Stoplin. In fact, the Prime Minister hated him so much, he launched an investigation to uncover what Rasputin had been up to, and even when he confronted the Tsar with this information, nothing was done to limit or even reduce Rasputin's influence. As I mentioned earlier, Rasputin had developed a certain reputation with the ladies, and no, it was not a good one. He was accused of having inappropriate relationships with the Tsar's daughters and other groupies, and things only got worse for Rasputin from there. He was accused of being an evil genius and was fast becoming a very unpopular man all over Russia. Many thought he was responsible for the weakness of the Russia's foreign policy at the time, which signalled an alliance with Germany, and this was downed by many Russians who preferred the idea of an alliance with France. So much so that in 1914, Chiona Goseva tried to murder Rasputin in Siberia. He was stabbed in the stomach with a blade which left him fighting for his life. During this attack, she allegedly shouted, I've killed the Antichrist, though of course she hadn't. Not from lack of trying, though. His true downfall came in 1916 when a group of Russian aristocrats decided it was time for Rasputin and his icy claws of influence in the royal family to come to an end. This plot was headed by Prince Philip Yusupov and politician Vladimir Purishkachev. Under the pretense that Yus- Yusupov's wife Irina, who was also the niece to Tsar Nicholas III, wanted to meet the so-called hol- holy man. However, it was believed that there was another reason for Rasputin attending the palace that evening, as he surely didn't believe the story about being acquainted with a colleague's wife. Although very little is known about how exactly the night went, and how Rasputin was in fact murdered, Yusupov admitted that he gave Rasputin a poisoned cake, though it did not seem to affect him in the desired way. However, this is a contentious point, as Rasputin was renowned for turning down sweet treats, as he thought this may adversely affect his healing powers. Now you can see why this theory may not be 100% accurate. What is for sure though, is that he definitely suffered from bullet wounds to the head and the stomach, which were the true cause of death. Although some rumours say that he was not finished off by the shot, and the perpetrators were forced to drown him in the Neva River. However, pathologists determined the cause of death to be blood loss from shots to the stomach, and there was no water found in his lungs to indicate drowning. There are reports to suggest that Rasputin had in fact predicted his own death. He wrote, I feel I shall leave life before January 1st, which turned out to be true, bearing in mind he was killed on the 30th of December. He also claimed to Nicholas II that if your relations who have wrought my death, then none of your children will remain alive for more than two years. This also rings true, as the whole family was murdered in 1918, along with the fall of the Russian monarchy. As with other elements of the story, it's hard to know what's true and what's fiction. It's possible for these statements to have been fake, though it's impossible to tell. Rasputin was a holy man who claimed to have healing powers, which got him involved in the Russian royal family at the beginning of the 20th century. His influence in the Russian court and with the Tsarina herself was unpopular, which led him to being assassinated by aristocrats in 1916. I do apologise for any mispronunciation in this video. But, said that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learnt something new about the controversial character of Rasputin. Um, If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more. um, And comment down below any video ideas you would like to see in the future.
but thank you very much and I will see you soon.